Ну что ж, друзья, добрый вечер. Dear friends, good evening. We continue Nobel Forum sessions. Но тем не менее, it's evening, but I am confident that we have big audience, a big number of people offline here at the site, at the venue. And today we would like to discuss design-led strategy, new thinking for business. Very interesting spoiler, which I would like to read. To you. Digitalization goes ahead, and we see growing competition of digital formats. The companies replicate their marketplaces, loyalty programs, fight for attention of tired people who have a lot of content every day. They receive push notes, etc. When we speak with the head of the company in Russia, the majority want very fast proved results. The guarantee of return of investment, which doesn't have the benchmark. At the same time, we listen that they would like to have something unique, not the replicated, the unique advantage based on integration, digitalization and some tricky research. Well, no, it's understandable. In other countries, there is a hype for being labor in laboratories, new humanitarian professions, skills of design, of innovations. Is this story of new methods applicable for the Russian large-scale companies? Will they miss their customers if they don't go into client-centric strategies? Or they can avoid that, solving the digital breakthrough solutions without going too deep. And I would like to introduce my guest, Kirill Sidorenko, Ernst and Young partner, a leader of clients' experience and innovation, and Ernst and Young, Nikita Zhuchkov, Russian Post, Director Inside Jody Turner, Culture Future. Com, inside of Foresight. She's an expert on culture and Pedro Janeiro, managing partner of Design Thinkers Academy. We graduated together with Kirill. We graduated from this academy, actually, and this agency is global. It's, it has offices in 25 countries. Good evening, dear colleagues. The first question is to Pedro. Pedro, you worked as a director in charge for innovation and business consultant for the last 20 25 years, you travel around the globe, you teach innovators, you teach them new skills. What is the demand for new techniques, new methodology? And what are these method techniques? And is there any business case for successful application of such methodology? Yes, hello everyone. Thank you for, uh, for the question. Um, there is a, a growing uh, anxiety even uh, to bring uh, something new to the market and companies struggle to create some differentiation and to understand actually their clients. Uh, and I think benchmarking is still useful, of course, but it's just not enough anymore. Uh, and perhaps a couple of stories might help to, to share how, how this is really not enough. Um, uh, we were working with a, a large bank uh, a couple of years ago and they had a very significant market share and they were very well on mortgage loans, they were very well on consumer loans, but they were falling way short of their market share on car loans. So for car loans they struggled and they wondered why and they reached out to us saying what's wrong with our service, what can we do because we, we seem to be doing everything right. Uh, we don't seem to do anything different from our competitors. And so why do we fall behind? What's going on? And so we, we did our research and we talked with the branch managers and we talked with the different departments inside the bank and we talked with car dealers and car salesmen. And when we approached car dealers and car salesmen and clients, the ones who were taking the loans, we suddenly realized there was a whole different story from what the bank was telling us. And the story, the surprising part of the story was when we realized that uh, sales dealers, the, the salesmen were saying, we never propose this bank because they pay us uh, uh, only two months after we sell the car. So we're waiting for two months until the money arrives. And that's when we, the salesperson, we get our commission and so I don't want to wait two months for my salary. I want to choose another bank 
who pays next day and I get my commission immediately. And so for the bank, this was just a very normal, you know, straightforward administrative process. We usually pay 60 days, what's wrong with that? And no one ever realized that this was hurting the business dramatically. Uh, and so this is when you get to actually talk with who is uh, in the front line actually doing sales for you, that you realize a little, the nitty gritty, the little points that hurt you. And even worse than this, on the day that the car will be sold, you can imagine the client arriving at the stand, you can see the car, you can see the car keys, and you're signing all the paperwork, and they're sending all that paperwork through email to the bank, and then uh, there's a bunch of administrative tasks going up and down, and the client is waiting like one hour, two hours, and then the bank says, oh, you're missing a paper, you need to sign another one. And then it goes through all the different uh, workflows inside the bank. Well, long story short, it will take five, six hours to get the car. So you can imagine how furious a client will be after waiting for five, six, seven hours until your bank sorts out all the administrative tasks that should really be almost uh, immediate. And they were totally unaware of this. For them, the business was done. I mean, they, they had approved it. They just had to do the paperwork. Salespeople were happy. Uh, and this is when everything went to, to a very dark spot and clients were mad. So once we corrected all of this with a beautiful website to have a wonderful interaction between the bank and, and, and car dealerships and sorting out all the paper, pro all the payment problems, their uh, share, their market share uh, went skyrocket and they regained the proper position that they should have in the market. Another story I'd like to share um, is about a soft drinks company uh, and these guys um, had a huge presence in the market. They were the biggest player in the market, actually. But they were seeing their, their market share being eroded by newcomers. Uh, and, and their marketing department was really hanging to the old flavors that they loved. They were very solid in the market, very happy about it. And they had a few dogmas that they were saying, in this market, no one pays more than two euros for a liter of orange juice or apple juice. And so that's what we go with. Our juice has high quality and that's what this market pays for. And so the guy from innovation was struggling to get his point across marketing that we need to gain to listen to our clients and find a way to develop new products and new services. And this is where I think a lot of companies are failing now, which is there's some knowledge around new product development. There's almost nothing around new service development. That's a very much an empty space that design thinking came along to provide proper methods to understand how do you design new services. And this is how this guy went along with this. And so he brought his product, new product development experience and decided, I'll open a sub-brand uh, with a new... A new um, uh, uh, a new website and uh, so this is part of the main brand of course but he started selling some new flavors and some new products just some short experiments sometimes just like 500 liters of a given um, of a given juice and he, he was spreading the news about this new website just along my own friends and family and asking everyone to spread it around he got a community of about four or five thousand people around it and he was testing the market, new flavors, new prices. He started selling at three euros, four euros, four and a half euros. He came as high as six and a half euros. So that's three times more than the average price they would be selling, three times more. And he was still selling out some of the flavors because they were so special, so unique. And so this demonstrated to the company that there was space the market was able to absorb a different type of product, a more luxurious product, more, more uniqueness, but also he used the platform to actually engage with these clients, talk to them, and have his team uh, listening to these clients to understand what's your mental model. You know, how do you actually choose these juices? Why do you pay this for the juices? Trying to understand how do you think about our products? And, and this allowed him to have a wealth of information that made him understand the market at a much higher level than they had before. Uh, and so by using this, 
they actually now started a bunch of new products into the market and they expanded their position in the market thanks to this newly gained knowledge by going through it to try to understand their client at a deeper level. If you allow me to share one single slide, just one small slide to say there is method in the madness. And so design thinking is a well-established body of knowledge that contains several methods. There's a methodology that really nowadays is quite well established and it really helps to, uh, to bring a structured approach to innovation, a very structured approach to innovation in the service design space. And so with that, um, Anton, I'll, I'll give back the word to you. Just the, fast, the fastest explanation of the methodology which you illustrated and demonstrated, it was the very essence. I have only one question. In the previous examples which you explained us in details how people applied this methodology and what's interesting is this this leap of faith, how they believed in this methodology, was it naturally because they, there were steps taken in design thinking? They are logical, they are intuitive and it could be vice versa. The market is very mature, the market of consultants, the market of clients. In your example, this was a direct demand formulated, articulated. Well, from, from my experience, when companies uh, have never used design thinking before and suddenly they decide to adopt it, there's a few reasons for it. Uh, the first one usually is they're desperate. So they've tried something else several times, different things, they don't know what else to do. Well, we might as well try design thinking. I mean, it sounds like something someone else is doing with some results. Uh, and so they turn to us saying, hey, can you guys actually help us? Because we, we tried a lot of things and it doesn't work anymore. Uh, and so uh, we're very happy when that happens, actually, because design thinking is very appropriate for these difficult problems that others are struggling with. Um, but another reason is usually uh, when they say, we do not know how to bring innovation on board. So we know how to pay salaries, we know how to, to put our salespeople selling, uh, we have our business processes, but we don't have business process for innovation uh, and so we we don't know how to do it uh, and that's when they can say can you help us to understand how do we create a, a innovation on a repeatable format that we can actually bring innovation at let's say more uh, with more confident with less cost with less risk to the market and that we can actually repeat the process uh, several times. Uh, and so when companies are feeling that the rest of the market is evolving and they're falling behind, uh, that's when they turn to us a lot of times and say, we, we don't want to fall behind. A bit like the bank and they're saying, we're falling behind. What, what, what are we doing wrong? Can we, can we do something different? Uh, and, and that definitely triggers something in, in people. Uh, sometimes, perhaps even coming to a conference like this one is also a good trigger. They decide, hey, why not? Let's try something like this. Thank you very much. Yes, of course, it's not because they are very successful. Uh, Jody, thank you very much for joining us. In your portfolio, there are such famous brands like Adidas, L'Oreal, uh, Nike, etc. There is an idea, there is a thinking that not all the companies uh, can adopt design thinking and this methodology. Could you give examples based on your own experience where it was useful for the company, for a brand, or a company and where it was a rather negative experience or your clients got ne negative experience applying design thinking? Give me the tough question, eh? Um, so, hello from West Coast, USA. Uh, I, I believe in design thinking. I worked with IDEO and they helped really promote it. They have IDEOU, so you can go online and take courses. Um, and anyone can learn about design thinking. Now, design has transcended. Design has become widely recognized for what it is, which is really a tool to help bring in change. Design thinking is, as you've seen, a process, but I see it as a bigger process. It helps 
us pursue certain qualities. It helps us to understand as a company what our purpose is beyond just making money to connect with people through culture and through emotion. And it helps us to begin to look out and see beyond the organization, to see beyond the walls what's going on in society so that we can really begin to move with society and serve certain needs. It's also about experimentation. How can we really experiment, as Pedro has shown? And it's also about collaboration and how, as a company, we tend to be vertical, and particularly in the U.S. And I apologize, I'm a dancer, so my hands have to be involved. And um, we are looking at how we can move beyond the walls of just our local cubes. And particularly in America, that's important. America needs this sort of thing to work beyond just money and to work beyond just always rising above and to work with each other better. And then, then the company itself feels empowered because they have new information flooding in and they have experimentation hand in hand with people like Pedro and the people on the, the panel that we're working with that um, can really help us to reduce unnecessary constraints and bring support in where it's needed while it's meeting needs, specific needs that are within context and relevance to the client. Now I'm saying all this because there is a limitation, right? Um, the limitation is it's iterative. So for instance, a positive example, of course, I have to bring a positive example, is Diageo. IDEO was working with Diageo, and that's an alcohol um, group. And as you work with, uh, as we worked with them, I did a lot of the cultural research. We brought it in, and at the time, it was really important to develop star bartenders. Well, where did that go to? Well, it went to a pandemic where it became more important to teach people how to be their own bartender. And it also went to a level where now we're teaching people how to have their own bars, teaching people how to be a business manager. And so, you know, design thinking can help you move from just creating a product that is elevated and uh, and enjoyed at a bigger level bars became bar, bartender stars bartenders became stars to a point where how can we serve people with kits in the home how can we teach people how to be their own bartenders how can we extend this culture um, in a new setting like the pandemic now the negative to me is working I think design thinking is very future leaning and it helps us clear the rubble right in front of our feet. And so we can take steps and it helps us all to move forward in future thinking, but it does not help us deal with big picture future change because it is so, you know, step by step by step. I think it's very important to do step by step, but if you're going to be dealing with disruptions, like right now I'm talking with Nike about, um, they're changing everything to digital, not just, they're changing their entire operations. Everything is digital. So now I'm coming in to help, you know, hopefully this is going to move forward to help with the communication with everyone. How do we then communicate with everyone in a way that shows that the future is going to benefit everyone? And um, design thinking can be many things. But dealing with disruptions like pandemic, it'll help in the steps to heal and the steps in getting back. And um, dealing with disruption of everything going digital, we can help with steps through design thinking and going in getting stabilizing. But when it comes to um, knowing that a pandemic is going to disrupt everything or knowing that digital is going to disrupt everything, that needs an extra element of future thinking. And that is something that we could talk about at another time. Yes, thank you, Jody. Really, uh, design thinking can work, and uh, not only can work, but was born because there is a big area of uh, indefinity. And we say disruption, disruption, and uh, when we feel that uh, this disruption is already here, we immediately get into uh, this big mess of in indefinite situation when we have nothing to compare with, and we need to test in, in short cycles uh, to move in small steps and to study step by step the need uh, which will result finally to some ideal condition, ideal product. Well, I think, uh, well, we will move on from abroad to Russia, to you, colleagues, and I think I have the quickest question for the whole session. Kirill, uh, what happens in Russia? Uh, well, I'll try to answer in the same manner. 
С одной стороны, on the one hand, the projects that take place here in state sector, in financial sector, in retail, I can tell you that I'm really pleased. I communicate with many people from abroad, and the things that may that our leading companies are doing, well, uh, we are really proud of this. And these are unique disruptive innovations. These are innovations in the area of ecosystem. It's really cool. I'm happy about this. That is on the one hand. On the other hand, I would like her to mention the problems. Because what we see, especially clearly now in post-pandemic times, we see the growing gap between some companies and or some organizations which are really moving quickly, changing their culture, changing the sectors of economy, and other companies. In other companies, what we observe now quite frequently, unfortunately, as it seems to me, the processes of innovations, well, actually decision-taking process in an indefinite situation get even more complicated, unfortunately. And unfortunately, the employees are not that prepared to take responsibility for these important innovative solutions. And uh, now uh, some, there are some projects when management of the company is trying to, uh, you know, some com to make kind of backup using traditional methods of investments into new projects and to try to apply this for innovations. And we make some complex economical complications, predictions, which, in my opinion, it has bad influence on these companies. So uh, technical feasibility reports, so uh, we are forecasting whether this innovation is going to work or no. I understand why it happens. I understand these organizations, but actually uh, this is really strong. I mean the processes and the way they happen, they stumble other processes. And considering the gap of several companies who are truly doing something important and moving forward, unfortunately we can see that in the nearest future there will be big changes if other companies do not change culture inside, do not change the processes, or do not invent models how to implement these disruptive innovations from inside. This is uh, an uneasy situation in the country. There are always uh, opportunities and there are risks. Anton, well, well, I don't know, maybe you are the one to answer this question. The center of innovations is here. You have uh, the most uh, advanced companies. How do you feel, especially recently for the, a year or two, after the pandemic, how do you experience this process in large corporations? It's a good question. Uh, this is, uh, uh, you, you return me the question. Okay. Uh, we actually provided to the market of corporate innovations kind of classical models of accelerators when there is a need and for this need, we choose different startups and technological solutions, and there is matchmaking, and at the edge, there should be kind of a pilot of some or some final product that will be scaled later on. But steadily, we started noticing that these matches do not happen all the time, or once a match happened, after a year or so, we get uh, feedback and we see that pilot never happened. Or there, was, uh, there were some defeated expectancies, and, uh, well, we have to do these innovations, and somehow we were made to get into client experience, and we liked it, because, first of all, now we use more mature language to explain to corporate client what for to use this innovation, how to use this. And we understood that there is a zone of indefinite. It is a minus one or zero step where still there is no benchmark where we should go to final consumer, go to people, so to speak, to understand the emotional component of these needs. Uh, this is kind of sales point through emotions. And only after that we would reach 
собственно, каких-то поисках технологий. Наверное, есть некая уникальность жилыми кварталами с офисами. В этом плане удобно. You have for this laboratory, and why the Post of Russia took the decision about this format, quite specific format, to open laboratory in Skolkovo. Well, how we arrived at this? We, for quite a long time, live in a paradigm that we have a concept. We make hypotheses, prototypes, we scale this, but we make hypotheses, prototype this inside corporation or involve startups or other partners. But we miss a very important part of all this. This is a client. And clients can make hypotheses with us and also make prototypes. So having come to this idea, uh, we realized that we can make a prototype. We can uh, generate lots of creative hypotheses. But until we get to know from the client whether this prototype solves the hypothesis that we have uh, invented, do they like it? Are they ready to use it? Are they ready to pay for this? Uh, does it increase value for you? Well. We can make a mistake, we can scale, and in scale we can see that our hypothesis, that clients possibly like it, that is possible wow effect. They used because it was fun. A kind of hallucination. A kind of mistake. Mistake of a motivated person. Too strong motivation prevents you from seeing their real life. And we came across to the point that new technologies, and we do not know that this will be serious production, that it will be scaled for our big network, 44,000 departments. We decided to make a typical feature of this department that by the operation it is regular, and its regularity will help us uh, to test hypotheses and prototypes that we have already brought to the product and uh, adapt this and adapt it for other departments. Adaptation is not needed, actually, because it was done for an average department. So, and uh, another reason, key reason, is communication with clients. When you tell the client that there is a huge, great technology, great product, and uh, there is no tactile cooperation. That is the issue, how skillful a storyteller you are. How did you sell it? Well, it's not possibly uh, you have not sold yet. You want to know whether they're ready to buy from you, if there is any interest to this. In this case, you are a storyteller. You should uh, make it attractive. And if from your story, you should understand not how beautifully you talked, but whether it was useful for your client and his or her perception. And this kind of storytelling is in uh, for our department. We implement a hypothesis there. To what extent you know startups with whom we made a joint developments, and these are around 10 startups and companies which are residents of uh, Skolkovo. Some of them are winners of our joint corporate accelerator. And actually, that was in the department in order to understand whether we have not made a mistake arranging a hypothesis that it will be useful. And even if we understand that.